and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark Stay. And I'm Mark DeVoe and welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to this exciting episode. This one's a good one. Oh my gosh. You've got to sit with us. This is going to be some fun and games that we're going to go through. But before we dive in, we'd like to thank everyone. Oh, yes. Everyone, everyone out there in podcast land that makes this show possible. Uh, thank you to all of our patrons who mm. are supporting the show each month with a tiny donation, a small donation, or a large donation of your choice to get all these extra amazing goodies, deep dives, hundreds of hours of extra stuff that you can delve in with. And also to our incredible, amazing academates for joining the Bestseller Academy and really living that writing, you know, living that goal that they want to create in their life and working away at it every single day and being a part of that, um, they make this podcast possible as well. So we salute you all. You Mr. Need. Stay, how are you today, sir? You've had a busy old day, haven't you? I have, yes. It's, um, well, I'm, I'm editing a short story. And um, after doing a few of these short stories, because I do sort of short stories for the Woodville books, I do them as newsletter things, you know, free. If you sign up to my newsletter, you've got a whole bunch of free short stories. I can say with absolute confidence that writing and editing short stories is the hardest bloody thing a writer can do. Novels, screenplays, piece of cake. But you try and make 5,000 words of story, character and big ideas into a cohesive narrative. It's blimmin' hard work. So, uh, yeah, uh, and thank the writing gods for uh, Julian Barr, who edits my short stories. He keeps them on the sh straight and narrow. But it's it's so, so tough. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like we've always said before, you know, if you have to condense it down and to the real pure kind of essence of what you're trying to get across and you don't have a single word to spare, it's much, much harder in some ways than writing a 160,000 novel where you can just go off with the fairies. Yep. And <laughs> 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 yep, 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 yep. Yeah, oh, no, it's, so that that's that's making me sweat bullets at the moment. But I've got a couple of um, release things. So uh, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that there's an audio book of Everyday Kindness, which is the anthology put together by the wonderful L. J. Ross, which has over fifty stories by some amazing authors uh, and, and me. Um, and and uh, my story is being read by none other, Her Majesty herself, Dame Julie of Waters, um, and that's. Uh, that's out today. Uh, well, it's actually, it would have been out a few days by the time you listen to this. So it's out now. So scurry along to Audible, look up Everyday Kindness, use your Audible credit or whatever to, to, to download that, and you're going to have hours and hours of great fun. So uh, Absolutely do, do brilliant. And remember out. that with that project, every I think a lot of the profits go to shelter. All the profits, uh, the homeless, all the proceeds all the profits, go to yeah. shelter, yeah. Yeah, which, which is a really is awesome charity fantastic. to support as well, to looking after homeless people in the, in the UK. So, well, that's very exciting, sir. I had uh, almost as an exciting week. Go on. Uh, as you know, last week you were talking about how you were the last person in the world uh, that hasn't done Wordle and like you felt yes. like you're there, you've been chased <laughs> by the zombies and about to get taken. <laughs> well, I kind of had that experience this week, but it wasn't around Wordle. It was around COVID. I, I finally joined the club. You got, got it. Got, <laughs> got, got me badge. Oh my gosh. I seem to like, I don't know how, I don't know how I skirted it for like the last two years, especially having kids going in and out of primary yeah, and secondary yeah. school. Right. I mean, you'd think that's a right old cocktail of uh, potential yeah. there, but the weirdest thing, the weirdest thing is Going back to just before the news about COVID broke, you know, you remember that weird time where we were all two kind years, of like, do you two remember years this? ago, yep. two, two, it was literally two years ago. And do you remember how we were like, how those first news articles came out and there was these kind of discussions mm. around the dinner tables and with friends about, oh, do you know about this weird virus? Thing? And then it just kind of went bonkers, like within a very short period of time. Well, during that window, I am absolutely 100% convinced I've had exactly the same thing oh. that I've had this last week. Exactly the same. So you're I mean, patient zero. This is all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so I say that I was the last remaining survivor, but I do wonder. Yeah. Because mm. I was right, you know, Western, far reaches of Western Canada out on a remote island somewhere and here. Anyway, very bizarre. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I've got my uh, hot lemon and uh, honey and uh, are, you, are, are you still are you still podcast? in it are you still in the th yeah. are you still in the throes of it i'm Is just still well in okay. canada now if you're double vaccinated you only have to isolate for five days and this is officially day five so um yeah i'm i'm good but uh get well yeah, soon it's it's all good but like you know have have lemon and honey will podcast right so yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely but um 
there's so much great stuff going on today. You've got a, I think, coming after this, you all go, isn't it? You've got a uh, book launch that you're being a part of as well. Yes, our, our wonderful friend Cueve McDonnell, uh, his the second Stranger Times uh, novel is out, and uh, we're going to be launching that. It's called This Charming Man, and we're launching that this evening. Uh, and the highlights, well, I think the whole thing will be available on YouTube and on his Facebook page as well. So that's always a really, really good laugh. It's and, a bit of a riot uh, with uh, Cueve, isn't it? Yeah, and it's live. Anything can happen. There are dancing dogs. <laughs> and it you know, will. it's uh, yeah, and it will. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge fun. So, um, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes to the um, the the YouTube page for that, so you can check that out. There'll be lots and lots of fun. Fantastic. Well, talking of COVID and pandemics and all the rest, we have quite the guest today, don't we, Mark? We do. Yes, it's quite on theme. Um, Bethany Clift is uh, our guest today, a graduate of the Northern Film School. Uh, she's also the producer of a low-budget horror film uh, called Heretic and the director of her own production company, Sabre Productions. But her debut novel, Last One at the Party, was published by Holder and Stoughton in 2021. And the rights were snapped up by Scott Free Films. That's Ridley Scott's company. And this story the last one at the party takes place after the human race has been wiped out by a virus no listeners come back wait come back okay because it's it's the story of the last woman alive and it's really funny and it's horrifying and it's moving and we discuss balancing horror and humor how watching et at an impressionable age inspired her and why this is exactly the right time to read and write about the end of the world well, let's delve right in, shall we? <laughs> Excellent stuff. <laughs> so have a have a get yourself a nice warm um cocoa, lock the doors, and uh, <laughs> enjoy enjoy this wonderful interview with the absolutely lovely Bethany Cliff talking with Mark. Bethany Cliff, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I'm actually on day day nine of COVID isolation. Oh, but, um, Although the isolation is now starting to get to me, <laughs> um, I am finally, fe- I, I sound a bit nasal because I'm finally feeling better. It's not, I wouldn't recommend it. It's not something that I would say one should go out and seek out, but um, it's not, I know it's not been as bad as it has for other people. I did lose my sense of smell, which was a bit strange, but um, but yeah, it's not, it's not been the nicest illness to have. So I think I could do one more day of isolation and then I'm going to go out and, not hug and kiss people in the street because no, that's still that. probably not the <laughs> safest thing to do. But I shall be at least smiling at strangers in a way that I'm sure will get me banned from supermarkets. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I share your pain. I've been, I've been there twice myself. So uh, oh my god, Tw- I can't even imagine. I've got well, pe- the- obviously it's wild in the schools, and there's kids that have had it twice, and I just feel for them and their parents so much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first one was a false alarm. I was absolutely fine. But it was like that thing, once you've been told you might have it, every little twinge, every little, you think, oh, my lips are hot. Yeah. Is, is that, is that, oh, is that, which, I mean, it could be, it could be worse, Bethany. It, it could be the virus 6DM, which is the virus. <laughs> That's, see, what a segue. I, eh? I'm a I professional. I have had that conversation with a few people who have said to me, I've had, I obviously get quite a lot of now because of the because of social media it's quite easy for people to write to you which I can say authors always love not Mm. if you're pointing out problems that you've found (laughs) with their manuscripts you go through it but otherwise (laughs) yeah we love it when you get in touch and I have had a number of people who have contacted me to say I actually read last one at the party whilst I had COVID and it made me feel better (laughs) because I at least knew that I wasn't gonna die in six days so you know (laughs) well let's 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 Public health stuff. <laughs> Let, let's talk about last one at the party, which on the day that we're recording this is Amazon's number one novel in dystopian fiction. So congratulations on that. On, <laughs> yes, yeah, thank it you. <laughs> and it's uh, it is yes. <laughs> this this sounds. I mean, look, this is it's set in December twenty twenty three, and the world as we know it has ended. There's a virus called six DM, six days maximum. That's the longest you've got <laughs> before your body destroys itself. And we've got one woman. An unnamed protagonist, uh, desperate to survive. Now, this this might seem like the last thing we want to read during a pandemic, <laughs> post pandemic. But actually, uh, listeners, go to Goodreads, go to Amazon, go to Waterstone, look at those reviews. People are loving it. This is really cathartic, isn't it? Because it's about life and it's about survival. T- tell us about it. Um, it is, and I think you know. The, I think the biggest kind of misnomer and the biggest thing that I always have to kind of like say to people is it's not a novel about a pandemic. 
the actual pandemic kind of element of it is over in about the first 30 pages. It's a novel about life after a pandemic. It's a novel about life after death, basically, because it's a novel about someone who survives. So it's it's a novel about her and her humanity and how you carry on being human once there's nobody else around you. Yeah. Um, and it's also about, you know, it's it's about that freedom that comes from nobody watching you anymore. And I think, you know, we live in a society where you're watched 24-7. Even if mm. you're not on social media, you're watched by cameras, you're watched by families, you're watched by friends, and everyone's got an opinion. <laughs> and I always say, you know, when, when I think about children and I think about school and I think about bullies, I always think about how when I was at school, when, you know, although there were mobile phones, they weren't as prevalent. And when you went home and you shut your front door, you were alone in that house and you could escape the outside world. And that's not true for anyone anymore. We don't live in a world whereby you can escape at any point. It's always there and it's constant. Um, so I think it's, it's it's, it's about this opportunity to kind of discover who you are without anybody else telling you who you're supposed to be. Mm. And yes, people have found, you know, I've, I've, people ha- people are finding it incredibly cathartic. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we are all to a lesser extent going through the kind of same process that my protagonist goes through in that we all, there isn't a single one of us in the last, you know, 24 months who hasn't had their lives affected by somewhere in some way by covid and by the pandemic that we've been through. And I think for a lot of us, we've also had this opportunity to stand back and look at our lives and say, you know, is this how I want to be living? Is, you know, the daily nine to five grinding up to London, spending 12 hours out of my house, three hours on the train either way, you know, is this actually how I thought I'd be living my life at this point in my life? Mm. Um, And for some of us, the answer has been, no. <laughs> and I think we've had a, you know, a unique opportunity to actually kind of to take that look and to think, how, how do I want my life to be going forward, which is exactly what, what my protagonist, my protagonist gets. So, mm. so whilst, of course, <laughs> we're not looking at the same kind of like degree of, <laughs> of um, desperation, I think, you know, we can all connect to her in some way because of what we've been through. So for the for the number of people who who can't, and I completely understand, don't want to read something about pandemic at this time. There's also, I think, the other flip side of the coin, which is that this is exactly the right time for some people to bring a novel mm. like this out because it does contain that hope of there is always hope. As long as you have life, you have hope. And that's the bottom line message absolutely. of my novel. No, it's absolutely. It's, it, is, it is incredible. And I think that goes for a lot of horror, doesn't it? It is very mm. much. It's about confronting our nightmares. It's about that catharsis and coming out the other end, feeling yeah. like you've you've um, you've bested something and then you can move on with it. And it's how we learn. I think it's, you know, I think people always say, why do people like horror? And it's like, because that's how you learn, how you deal yeah. with those situations. And of course, we're never going to deal with something whereby someone wearing the face of somebody else is running around a farmyard <laughs> chasing us with a chain. Well, I'm going to hope that Speak for yourself, to- <laughs> speak for yourself, Bethany. You need to come to the Kent countryside. I can show you a few things. Um, but, you know, but it's not about the man with the chainsaw it's about that survival it's about Mm. finding that emotional kind of strength to get through and and that's what it's about as you say very much so i mean one thing about covid is at least you know we have technology to communicate to keep us all together to keep in contact with the ones we love but your protagonist who after her husband dies she doesn't speak to another living person through you know throughout the story which is You've you've given yourself a big challenge there. How did you <laughs> did any any regrets? <laughs> so so the opening lines, I'm not going to tell you exactly what the opening lines are because you might have viewers of with sensitive ears, but but the opening lines in the opening kind of first two paragraphs, she says, and it was the first thing I wrote. I wrote the book book sequentially, and the first thing I wrote, and this was my my basic bottom line that I stuck by through the entire thing, she says. She speaks to, she says the last thing that she ever says to another living human being. And she says, I never physically spoke to another human being again. And that is what I wanted. I wanted a situation whereby after those last two words that she says, she never speaks to anyone again. And I was really, I, w- I was really kind of like strong and strident about that. And quite early on in the process, I had some feedback, which said, you know, she's a great character. We really love her. It would be brilliant if she could meet 
somebody else and they could go on a journey together. We can learn more about her and, you know, how she would react in this new world to someone else, you know, and I, and, and it was brilliant feedback and, you know, had the potential to kind of like push the novel in a different direction, but in a direction whereby, you know, there would be people more interested to read it. But I'd always wanted, I wanted to write about someone who was the last person left alive. Mm. And I wanted to write about someone who was not suited to being the last person left alive, <laughs> um, who had no skills <laughs> and would basically just make a real mess of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, I think, and, you know, and I'll be totally honest, there were places where I was like, oh, for God's sake, like, you know, it, this is just really hard. But it's also incredibly freeing. Because you don't have to worry about there being somebody else that she's got to pretend to be a certain person for. Right. She just is her. And I think, you know, for, for some readers, that's been, they don't like her and she, she doesn't act in the way that they would want her to act. But for me, she acts in a realistic way. I mean, yeah, I've had, I've had some feedback that said, oh my God, she's a total bitch. And I'm like, yes, she might be, but I'm not sure that you would react differently were you to find yourself in her situation so yeah <laughs> but, that's, but that's the thing she's the the other thing it, it affords you as an author is the light and she's not one note you know she, th this allows you mm. to do a real character study to dig re to really get inside her head and mm. and and do it brilliantly and um you know so that that must have been Great fun because obviously the thing is with a debut novel, everyone and particularly if it's in the first person, people assume that it's you, and it's not. It's kind <laughs> yes. of you. My shifting. mum has read this novel. You can imagine. <laughs> yeah. My mum has read it. My in-laws have read it. Family and friends in far-flung places like Australia, Australia and New Zealand have read it, and I feel like I should have caveated at the front and said, "This is not me." And <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, you know, when I think. It's interesting because I'm filling in a kind of like a question, a questionnaire at the moment, a kind of like, you know, a, a question and answer author thing. And one of the things they say is, you know, how much are your characters based on yourself? And I always have to say, like, I unfortunately am far more boring than, <laughs> than she is and far more boring than any of the characters that I've written. You know, I think you take, for me, you take these kind of small all emotional events in your life and you think how can how can I push that so it's actually mm. interesting yeah you know like yeah. how can I you know I mean I've suffered I, I I I have suffered from panic attacks I know what it's like to suffer from panic attacks I don't feel that anybody's particularly excited to learn about how I suffer from panic attacks if I have to drive on the motorway do you know what I mean that's not yeah. it's not hugely literary so how do you take your own personal experience and apply it to someone who is feeling that times a hundred and I mm. think that's kind of that's where your own personal experience influences what you write yes is in a lot of cases I can imagine it'd be very you know it's things like I, I'm not sure how easy it would be to to write about falling in love if you've never fallen in love yeah yeah I think there's things you can make up and then there's things that I think you do genuinely have to experience in order to be able to you know like the like the panic attacks you know I've had people who've written to me and said this is one of the first times that I feel I've really seen that on a page where I've right. connected to it and it's felt like my experience. And I feel like, you know, you get it a lot kind of on TV where people are like, oh God, I'm having a panic attack. But what you don't see on TV is that I, like, you know, you you kind of vomit and you you can't control your bowels properly. And you're like, do you know what I mean? And you're sweating and you think, you know, you're lying on the floor in a ball. And, and so I guess, and I think that that's the great thing about novels is they give you that opportunity to stretch that, to show kind of like that mm. breadth of experience that people have. Absolutely. What a lovely thing to talk about. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's not it's, all the novel is, everyone. There are. <laughs> there's a lovely dog. Well, that, yes, there is a lovely dog. And it's a funny book as well. It's, uh, you know, there's humour all the way through. Were you very conscious of that sort of balance between horror and humour, which are quite oh God, yes. close cousins, yes, 100%. aren't they? 100%. You know. I mean, you know, no matter how you dress this up, it's like, you know, I'm not going to say you can't polish a turd because obviously <laughs> that's not quite the analogy you need. Right? But, you, you you know, you cannot deny that this is a woman at the end of the world and she's lost everything and everyone that she loves. And, and you know, she was someone who really did rely on her support network and that's gone as well. Like, you know, her best friends have gone, her family have gone, her husband's gone. But at the same time, I feel like 
you know, there's only so much, so much misery you can write. And also because of the character that she is and because of the fact that she is in a uniquely British landscape and, you know, dealing with uniquely British things, there is that, that comedy that we find in bad yeah. weather and bad situations and irony. And we have, you know, as a, as a nation... <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't talk about this without thinking about how the government's running at the moment. But <laughs> as a nation, you only have to look on kind of like our Twitter feed to see how we're able to turn these situations, which are yeah. horrific and, mm. you know, just horrible for so many people. But we always, I think we have a brilliant way of kind of addressing them with warmth yes. and with a kind of humour that it, whilst it doesn't actually... You know, we're not taking the mickey out of anyone. We're able to see the ridiculousness of ourselves. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think I think it it was it probably isn't the sort of thing that I consciously sat down and thought every fourth page I'm gonna do a little joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I did I think there's definitely a sense that there has to be levity amongst this, amongst the misery. There has to be something that makes the reader think. You know, and as I said, I've had people say, you know, I've laughed and cried within the same chapter. And obviously that's brilliant. And that's exactly what yeah. I wanted is you turn it on that pin kind of like, you know, you have to kind of like go up and down. Absolutely. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I, th I think I think if this if, you know, if the British need a national slogan, it should be got a, <laughs> got a laugh in you. you know? <laughs> If you can translate that into Latin, put that uh, yeah. on the passports. <laughs> Everything, I've, I've literally, I'm writing my new book at the moment and I've just literally written something in Spanish and then written it in English and my <laughs> character has literally just said, it sounds a lot better in Spanish than in English. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go back to where it all started. I'd like to talk about, because, you know, you've worked in TV and films while you've been a film producer and all sorts of extraordinary stuff. Um, but I hear that it started with a trip to the cinema, and you were terrified by that infamous movie monster that has terrified <laughs> generations of children and adults, E.T. <laughs> I know. My horror started so young, Mark, so young. He's and an ugly little spud, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's one of my most formative men memories, mm. and I, I was very young. I, well, not very young. I mean, it must have been six, seven. I can't even remember. Right. Um, but we used to go to the pantomime every year. There's a local theatre. My parents on on Boxing Day or between Christmas and New Year used to take us to the pantomime. And one year, my mum had had flu over Christmas and she'd been really ill. And we'd all got colds. And they said to us, "We're going out." And we were like, "We just don't want to go to the pantomime. We really, we, you know, what kids can be like, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> and we just really didn't want to go. We didn't go to the pantomime. We went to a flea bit an old cinema, you know, back in the day when they really were, they kind really of, were you know, kids. downtrodden. Yeah. And it's, mm. it's now, it's now a bingo hall. And, um, <laughs> and we watched E.T. And I can remember my brother was younger than me. My sister was a couple of years older. My mum sat on one end. My dad sat on the other end. We shared two boxes of Maltesers. <laughs> it like, <laughs> probably sounds so boring. It's not. And, and I remember kind of like, you know, the introduction of E.T. when he's in the shed with the bright light. And I can, you know, us kids, like my brother moved to sit on my mum's lap. I was like clutching at my dad. And it was just this moment of kind of like, oh, my God, why have they brought us to see this? This is ridiculous. Yeah. I'm so scared. And I was watching it through my hands. And then that journey from something which can be so petrifying so by the end, we were all like, we'd all got colds. We were all feeling terrible. There was like tissues everywhere. <laughs> like eyes were streaming. We were like sobbing with kind of, you know, <laughs> God, to live. Oh, let him go. And, and I can, you know, I can just remember the kind of the visceral response that we had as a family to something on screen mm. that just has never, has almost never been surpassed for me. And it was, you know, my my kind of like six, seven year old mind did not register at the time. But I remember, you know, I honestly can remember throughout my entire childhood thinking that that is amazing. Yeah. That something someone can make that. That's amazing. That mm. is something that I want to do. And and it has stayed with me as this bright kind of shining memory of my youth for since, you know, God, you know, practically 40 years later, I'm still, I can still talk about it. Yeah. And I yeah. feel, you know, 
and that was it and that was just that was just it and I can remember kind of you know I used to go to cinema my mom and dad but as soon as I was able to go out on my own I used to go on a Saturday afternoon when I was 13 or 14 and I'd go to the cinema on my own and I'd see whatever I could see yeah, yeah. and I saw some you know terrible stuff but then I saw things like Moonstruck and I saw like you know movies that were absolutely like brilliant and probably far too old for me to watch <laughs> but I didn't you know I didn't go shopping I went to the cinema and I watched things and it was just yeah and it's just I think it's always been there it's always been this kind of part of my life and mm. and E.T. so Steven Spielberg there you go Stephen, thank you <laughs> fantastic I mean that was that was around the time he was producing Poltergeist as well and there's a lot in, those two <laughs> yes. films have a lot in common you watch them yes. back to back they... and it, and the other thing that I really like you know that's that's just incredible about it is that level of fear and of terror that you got in a kid's mm, movie, Yeah, you know, that was done so subtly and so simply. And I just feel it, it, it's just, it's just brilliant. It's just genius. It's, you know, and it, it remains one of my favorite films and I haven't Quite actually too. shown it to my children yet. Um, <laughs> Because I, it's one of those ones where you fear if they don't react in the same way, you'll love them slightly less. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible yes. thing to say. <laughs> yes, it is. I, I remember, you know, uh, I showed my kids um, Gremlins far too. I forgot how genuinely scary that film is. Yes, and my, oh my, God. <laughs> my son was about six and then ran out the room. And they still, he's, he's, he's 19, <laughs> my daughter's 22. They still bring it up now all the time about how I taught her. So... Job done, dad of the year. Um, so <laughs> that that you know inspired something in you. Did that sort of get you writing? Were you writing? F you know, did you want to make films? Did you want to write stories? How, how did you get get the habit? So I've always written. I've always written. I think you know, as long as as far as as far as, as long ago as I can remember, my first prize that I ever won was for a story that I wrote at school, and then I won a Blue Peter badge for writing <gasps> a poem about bullying. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and basically what happened was they'd done a competition and I wrote this poem about bullying because I'd been bullied at the time. And I and I did it through you do did it through your school. And in school assembly, <laughs> they made me get up, go to the front, accept my certificate certificate and my blue Peter badge, <laughs> and then read the poem about bullying. And right. I I am kidding you not, my life was an absolute fucking excuse my language misery <laughs> for the next three months because obviously the level of bullying that I had experienced in order to write the poem oh god the went irony. up to a whole new kind of like you know <laughs> expert level that has not been seen before so oh, so man. so I think I gave up writing a little bit after that no and but then I kind of, I really got back into it when I went to university right. and Oh God, this makes me sound such like this is terrible to admit. But when I did my, so I was at university and I did humanities and I was doing postmodernism, but I was also doing digital film and I was doing, um, and I was doing film as well. I was doing media because I didn't, because it was easy and I didn't want to have to write stuff. <laughs> and you could either do a dissertation or you could make a short film up to 10 minutes. And I right. obviously did not want to write 20,000 words because I was. Not. Yeah. And can, t can still am um, incredibly lazy. So instead, I decided that I would I would make a short, short film. And I made a short film. It's about eight minutes long. And it's called Soliciting. And it was about a woman in a hotel room. And you see everything from her point of view. And she's talking to a man who's lying on the bed. And basically, she's he's got her to come up to his hotel room because he thinks that he's going to have his wicked way with her. And But she's stealing all his money and stuff. Right. And then... And then basically in the last shot, you realise that she's not only stolen his money, but she's slit his throat. So <laughs> now that I look back on it, but it's, 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 it's really done kind of like, so you're with her the whole way through. And then kind of at the end, you realise that not only is he handcuffed to the bed, but he's dead. And you're like, whoa, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> and then she walks off down the corridor to the strains of, and I'm feeling good. <laughs> and it was the first thing I ever wrote. It was the first thing I ever put on screen. And I got a first for it. And I thought wow. to myself, do you know what? This is fun. Brilliant. And actually, this is something that I can do and enjoy. And that was kind of it. And then I left university and um, and I, I went off and I went traveling and I wrote my first book while I was traveling. Um, simply because I couldn't make anything. So I thought I'll just write a book instead because I you have downtime when you're traveling. And yeah. I had a notepad and a pen and, you know, so I thought I'll do that. And I wrote a book. Uh, called Charlie's Angels 
And it was about a chap who'd gone to Hollywood and sold a script and fallen in love and then fallen out of love. And and I kind of wrote it over six months, didn't think anything of it, sent it out and had an agent come back and say, I really like it. Let's work on it together. So I was like, oh, my God, I'm a writer. I'm a writer. I'm 22. I'm a writer. This is amazing. And we worked on it together for about six months. And then I received um, an email and it said, and this is back before you could send like big stuff fire. So I used to set, I used to have to type it, print it and send it. And, uh, and the email said, uh, after this last draft, I no longer believe in this anymore. So I'm sorry, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> if you would like your manuscript back, please send me an SAE with X amount of postage on it. Oh. And I was like, oh, 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 oh. And, and, and that was it. That was, that, that was the end of my writing career. And I don't think I wrote for about another couple of years. So I was just so gutted. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then I started writing again. And then I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And then, and then I went to the Northern Film School and did a screenwriting course. Um, and that was amazing. Um, and just taught me so, so much amazing stuff. And, like, and I'd done humanities as an undergrad. And that had been fine because I'd got to go to the pub a lot and live away from my parents. But, you know, the one thing I would say, if you ever get the opportunity to study something that you love... Mm-hmm. just do it because the two years that I spent in Northern Film School were you know they were the best two years of my life I mm. mean you know don't get me wrong I, I love being married and having kids yeah but, but the you know. actual <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> what's that and um, but the ability to actually immerse yourself and it was so immersive as well like the first year we were five days a week being tutored by the most amazing tutor the course was run by LB James who is just brilliant and it was just the most, fa- it was the most fantastic thing. And everyone on it was like, oh my God, we're so lucky. This is amazing. <laughs> and we just did nothing but write and talk about writing and practice writing and make things and meet incredible people and do incredible things. So yeah, so that was amazing. Fantastic. Um, and then Pete, I met my Pete, my husband Pete on the course and then we left the course and a couple of years later we were like, this is really hard. We don't get to do anything. We don't get to see any of our stuff be made. Like, let's just make something it'll be fine come on let's make a movie uh you know come on if everyone else can do it we can do it. we'll just raise some money who cares it'll be lovely uh, so we did so we raised some money and we made a movie uh called heretic mm. and it was i always forget whether it was number six or number eight in the tesco's charts at the weekend Excellent. but it was it was top 10 definitely top 10 and um and yeah, so we made a movie. It got a UK cinema release. It did really well on DVD charts, and um, it was a horrendous experience. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm more I, like, oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> I, I think I think we might have to get you and Peter in to do a special episode on that because oh, um, I tell it's. You, it's it's amusing because we've had so many people contact us and say, you know, the movie was fine, but my God, you're like, because we did a commentary over it. Uh, right. for the dvd so we did a director producer commentary um and it's hilarious because obviously it's incredibly lo-fi so what we have to do is like sit on our sofa watching the movie yep. on the tv whilst recording us mm-hmm. talking about it at the same time and we tried it one time and we got about 15 minutes in and we were like oh my god this is so dull this is so dull <laughs> and then pete was like i know how to say i know how to make it better and i was like oh okay are you gonna like because we got the microphone hung from a broom are you gonna move the microphone and he went and he like made two massive jugs of fajitos and he's like drink <laughs> so, like, so basically we had a couple of drinks and then oh my god i'll tell you what that commentary is sparkling no <laughs> but it's it's a good commentary because basically you know, we we are because we made it ourselves. We're in cohorts with no one, so we're quite honest about the yeah. uh, about making it, and it's not an easy process. <laughs> no, it's a bit like COVID. If you if you do it, you do it. Would I recommend it? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just 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 think about it beforehand. That's what I'd say. <laughs> I say. I I genuinely want to get you both in to do a special. We have deep dive episodes. <laughs> we should definitely do that because um, you know I've I've had a couple of films made. I can talk about my experience on that too. It could be a lot of fun. Oh but, God, yeah that but, that would be great to like chat with someone who's actually kind of like gone through kind of the same sort of thing because I think it's. It's really interesting, like, 
having an inside and an outside perspective because obviously we had the outside perspective of always kind of being the bridesmaid and never the bride and yeah. I think it's very difficult in the film and TV industry because you get so far and then everything just collapses it's like a kind of you know it's it is like a house of cards in the mm. you know the the card on the bottom which might just be someone who's going to give you somewhere to film it or whatever disappears yeah. and the entire thing comes tumbling down so yep. quickly yep 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 so, yep yeah. <laughs> yep, <laughs> well, yep, let, yep let's yep. let's set that up but i think <laughs> for your next tv production things might go a bit more smoothly hopefully because tv rights for last one at the party have been sold can you talk much about that or is that still a bit top secret? i i i can talk i can talk a little so uh <laughs> yes so I'm very lucky and it's very exciting and uh, Scott Free have brought the TV Brilliant. rights, so Ridley Scott's company. Um, obviously, everything has, as with everything else, been very delayed with COVID. Yeah. Um, and the problem that I think there is now is that there is a huge backlog of stuff that's waiting to get green lit and waiting to actually use production facilities and, and shoot. Yeah. Um, but it is... It is still going ahead. Um, I get kind of regular updates on where it is and what's happening, and it's all very, very exciting. Um, so yes, it's it's. I I can't say when. I can't say where. I can't really talk about anything because nope, <laughs> fair enough. it's all very strict. But it's um, yeah. It's 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 one. I didn't. I'll be honest. It's weird having come out of kind of like doing film and TV for so long, it didn't even cross my mind that someone would want to buy the rights. <laughs> and the rights <laughs> sold about literally two or three, I think it was really close, like literally two or three three weeks, maybe a month after I had the publication deal, we, we kind of had interest from some big companies and, and it's strange because I went, I went to see them and I was like, oh my God, this is like, you know, so I went, to, so when we went to see Scott Free, obviously it, it's, it's like Ridley Scott's building in Soho and um, we went upstairs and we had the meeting in his office and his office is filled with memorabilia from his yeah, films. I bet. I bet. So, you know, there's stuff from The Martian, there's stuff from Blade Runner, there's stuff from oh. Prometheus. And so I kind of like sat on the sofa and I'm obviously just the world's, I'm not the world's biggest sci-fi geek, but I'm I'm pretty much up there, I would say. <laughs> and um, and my eyes were on stalks. And I met with the with the really lovely, um, really lovely head, and she was really she's so nice. And I said, and we've been talking for a couple of minutes, and I said to her, I am so sorry, but can I just walk around the room and have a look at everything before we start? Because I'm just <laughs> not going to be able to concentrate after this. And she was like, yeah, of course she can. And I was like, oh, my God. And I went round and I just, you know, when you're just like, this is, it's like the science museum yeah. or like the natural, yeah. this is like the whale in the middle of the natural history museum. It's Treasure. Like, it, yeah. 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 It, it, it's, and, and it's just madness because it's just there. And you think, you know, these things exist in real life. They're mm. like, they're prop, you know, they're real life props and real life things. And, you know, Matt Damon was inside that suit. <laughs> it's just like, so, so yes. So I did kind of embarrass myself slightly, but I also got to look round. So <laughs> no harm, no, no foul. <laughs> absolutely. That seize the moment. Um, we're going to have to wrap this up now, Bethany, uh, which is a shame because I could, pretty much talk to you all day about this stuff but <laughs> what's coming next from you is there another novel on the way yes so next is the paperback of last one at the party is out on february the 17th which is really exciting nice. um i when i when the hardback came out i did a lockdown launch day so i did a photo shoot of all the things that i couldn't do during <laughs> lockdown like book signings and going for lunch and getting dressed up with the glam squad and having a launch party um so i this time i'm doing a non-lockdown launch day where i'm going to do all those things so Brilliant. my twitter is beth underscore clift um and my instagram is at beth right stuff uh so if you want to look on february the 17th you might find something kind of pretty cool going on which is good um and also in the summer, my um, second novel, uh, Love and Other Human Errors, is coming out, which is about, uh, well, it's about love and it's about quantum computing. So it's uh, <laughs> two <laughs> very uh, comfortable bedfellows. So, yeah, so it's basically it's about um, a woman who has never been in love, but she writes a um, 
an app, an algorithm that finds you your soulmate across any universe. So basically, she uses quantum to find you your soulmate, no matter what your what path your life takes. Um, and in order to sell it, she has to demonstrate it herself. Uh, and it's about what happens then. So Fantastic. it's a romance, which is a bit different to last one at the party. Um, but it's still got kind of it's got it's got female figures in it that people will write to me and say, "Wow, she's a bitch." <laughs> 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 so I'm looking forward to that again. <laughs> Fantastic, Bethy! Thank you so much for speaking to us. Let's get you back on as soon as possible. And uh, and and folks. This uh, last one at the party, out there in paperback, go grab your copy ASAP. Excellent. Oh, look, I think my screen's come back on. No, it's not. I'm so sorry I have no screen, everyone. I've got terrible Wi-Fi. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank Th- you. Thanks, Bethany. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy that's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy yeah we couldn't time that better could we really mark because uh you know everything that uh, bethany was talking about is is kind of like what i've been experiencing this week but the thing <laughs> that i loved i mean i know this has been a conversation that's kind of come up a you know fair amount because of covid but i really think it's worth chatting a bit more about it is this idea about how covid has given us this chance to reflect pretty deeply on life and the meaning of life and and i love the fact that bethany embraced that as a kind of a concept because um we haven't really had that opportunity i think in our generation i think maybe if we go back in you know probably the wartime generation was another time where, where, you know, when there's a lot of death around you, you know, I think that's when it, it, you know, you start to um, think about your own mortality and you think, and then that leads you more to to those questions about what am I doing today? And am I really making the most of my life? And do I want to be doing what I'm doing? Um, And I think that's really healthy. I think there's something we should be all be doing every week of our life if we can. But I think there's been a kind of a global reflection that's going on. Have you found that as well? Oh, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of people saying, okay, do I really want to sit in an office staring at a screen for the rest of my life? Do I really want to be doing this? Do I really want to be doing that? And then deciding to, to you know, to, to step out and, and be a bit brave and step out their comfort zone and do something a bit different. Um, so, yeah, I think this, uh, I mean, obviously not everyone's like that. Some people have had a ghastly experience with COVID, you know, and mm. it will be, you know, the worst part of their lives and something that they'll they'll you know just will be glad the further it gets behind them the, the you know the happier they'll be but there's yeah there's no doubting that this has affected everyone as bethany said in one way or another you know at the, i'm very much at the lower end of the scale um it's uh you know so it's um th- and this is why i'd love horror as a genre because it takes the things that scares us and we confront it and it's cathartic and it and it's thought provoking it gets us thinking about our lives and where we're going and the things that we've done so uh and and she's done it brilliant and like i say she balances humor and uh and it's moving and it's terrifying and it's got everything everything i want from a from a story mm, mm. and it's really interesting isn't it well because i think i think we'll see this across all kinds of writing as well um coming uh, during covid um and as importantly beyond covid as well for the years to come now because this will all be a kind of point in our life that will we'll all reference back at constantly oh do you remember when and yeah. hopefully hopefully we'll be talking like that and not still kind of like all trying to keep our you know um you know keeping us kind of motivation going whilst we're really going through the kind of what feels like the drudgy end of it hopefully but it, it does and we keep saying that on the podcast don't we and i think oh, bloody hell. <laughs> but but the really interesting thing is is that i do think it's going to make writing a lot deeper like if you were to take all of the books that are coming out 
all, I can't imagine one book in the same way that you know, Bethany was saying, no one has no one has not been affected by COVID in some way or others. I don't think any single book that will be now published will not be affected by COVID. And not necessarily because they're writing about, you know, you know, fighting for toilet paper in the in the stores, but <laughs> just how it affects us at a, on even a subconscious level, how it affects how we see the world. In some way, every novel, every book that's written will be some way slightly different or very different because of what we've all gone through. That's really interesting. This idea that wherever you are, you know, wherever it's affected you, or a lot of people think the whole thing is a conspiracy, you know, or right, whatever right. end of the, the scale you are. Mm. Uh, I think it is a fixed point in time and it is, you know, you, you do have to reflect on that. And yeah. um, it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're right. It's a very interesting point. Yeah. It has made us all think a bit more about, about our lives. Well, the thing that really blows me away about it is that it's a global event, which is completely weird and unusual yeah. to have experienced, yeah. right? And we, we sometimes think events are global. We think the World Cup is global, but not everyone's into footy. You know, we think we think um, the passing away of somebody incredibly dear and close to us as a nation is global, but actually there are people in like, you know, forests in you know, the Amazon that have never, never even heard of them. But this, this is kind of like a global event in some ways, but what it really nails down is it goes, always goes back to what, what we call human condition, which is, I think what Bethany's really been, you know, probably exploring in this novel. And, and so even if it's somebody in the far reaches of say Africa, writing a novel, it's gonna in some way have touched them. And, um, yeah, I'm just I'm just interested. I've always said this, but I'm always interested about all the positive stuff that might come out the back end of this. Mm. Maybe we'll all be a little bit more on purpose with life mm. um, as individuals, you know, if we've had that opportunity to reflect and question. But but I will say, um, moving on from the deep stuff, I think it's fascinating that she had one character in the book. I mean, mm. like you were saying, it's hard enough writing a book. Anyway, why make it harder? <laughs> I mean, really? Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there, there are a few novels like that, a few movies like that, and it becomes a character study. And that yeah. is all about digging deep and uh, exploring every facet of, of that character. And put, as she said, I think that the key uh, is she said she took the, the person least likely to survive an apocalyptic event and put mm. her in it. And I think that's always a great character tip. Whatever the, the goal of your character should be, they should be the worst person in the world to, to take that on because it's an even yeah. greater challenge for them. It's an even greater mountain to climb. And if you're making, uh, you know, that task all the more difficult for them, then, you know, it ramps up the tension and the drama and everything that comes with it. So I think that's a great, great idea. But yeah, that, that thing of sustaining one voice for that length of time, that's, that's really hard. That's that really is hard, hard, isn't it? I almost think I always think of. I once saw Francis de la Tour do a monologue in the West End. Oh yeah. My parents took me when I was very young, and uh, I couldn't believe that someone could just sit on a stage and talk for two hours. <laughs> it's yeah. just random. And um, I guess in some ways, though, you know, Bethany's kind of sussed it out. If you know, in terms of having to deal with dialogue. I mean, there is inner dialogue, I guess, isn't there? But if yeah, you, yeah. you yeah. remove all of those challenges of like dialoguing between, yeah. but then I guess in some ways you end up dialoguing with yourself, which is actually probably even harder, isn't it? Because well, she it's does, the voices in the, your head. There is a dog. Don't forget there's a dog. Right, right, you know? yeah. And, you know, if you look at stories like this, uh, Precursus is so I am legend, there's a dog. Mm, mm. Um, if you look at uh, Castaway, the movie, the Tom Hanks movie, there's Wilson the ball. You know, so there's, yeah. <laughs> there is, there is Artistic always, license. <laughs> you know, um, Hamlet has Yorick, you know, uh, there's always yeah. some device that, uh, that, that you can at least bounce your ideas off. And I think that's, that's important to have. Yeah. Well, we all, but we all have those conversations in our head, don't we as well? I mean, we're, you know, self-talk is, it, it's a character in many ways. And depending on who that inner character is, you know, depending on what day of the week it is for some people as well, whether they're feeling up or down. And I mean, that in itself is a whole other world, isn't it, of exploration? Yeah. I think a lot yeah. of people don't often go there because it's... And you can have that thing where you've got the angel and the devil on your shoulder. Right, you know, that, yeah. That inner conflict as well, you know, and which of those do you do you surrender to today? 
So yeah, yeah, there's there's all kinds of ways to sustain that. But even so, sustaining that over the length of the novel, that's um that's tough. That's really, really tough. And she's done it. Now we've been talking about doing themes on this podcast, you know, a couple of, you know, theme over a month, for example. And one idea I've got, which I'm going to chuck out right now, is this idea of dystopian movies. Um, mm. Because, I mean, British dystopia <laughs> is brilliant. I mean, it's somewhere in there has to be a cup of tea, right? You know, it's like, okay, the zombies are coming, put the kettle on. Um, but it'd be interesting to explore because of, you know, obviously with the, I, I think it's really, really nailed a point about this idea that, um, this is almost the perfect time to read Bethany's novel. You'd think that people would be absolutely sick of, you know, the pandemic wouldn't even want to go near it, but actually it's almost the perfect time to read something like this, isn't it? Because you want to, you want to confront, you know, something even maybe bigger and scarier to, to put it into some kind of perspective. Yeah. I mean, some people do, some people don't. I mean, we were talking last week to Jeev about this thing that was in the bookseller that publishers are looking for books with joy, you know, cozier mm. stuff that will sell. And I'm sure, you know, there's a big market out there for that. But, you know, it's like if you've got a toothache, you keep ah, uh, keep pressing the tooth of your tongue, don't you? Uh, and that's a, that's very much a human trait that, you know, we keep, we'll keep prodding this thing until, um, until it bleeds. So, uh, so yeah, I think, you know, and, and for me that, as I said earlier, that's what horror is all about, about confronting these, these, these dark parts of our lives and, and coming out the other end, feeling all the better for it. Mm. Um, so yeah, not, not everyone will want it, but I think if you, if that's your, if that's your thing, it, it's, um, it will be very cathartic. It'll be very revealing and very, very thought provoking. And, uh, yeah, I think you're going to see, you might see a split. You might see a split right down the middle in the kind of content we'll be getting over the next few years where people run away from it and people embrace it. So uh, be yeah. interested to see how that develops. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think that it's worth remembering that usually the most successful novels are not the ones that kind of sit very neatly in, in you know, on the fence. Like pick, pick an extreme. Either go full horror or full joy. <laughs> yeah. Either way, you're going to find an audience. Um, <laughs> because I know, I remember we talked about this before about how, you know, it's sometimes more important to pick an extreme. And yeah, you are going to end up upsetting some people or turning off a group of yeah. people. But I think one of the things that I learned quite early on is that you have to, you really do have to pick, pick your kind of place. You can't please and everyone. Stick with it. Exactly. Yeah, and you don't you want can't. to please everyone because you no. if you try to, then you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna actually find an audience. I think a lot of people are very scared about saying, I'm gonna write this really, really niche, 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 niche subgenre, because they all think there's never gonna be anyone out there that's gonna find it. But the point is, is and we all know this, if you search on Google, what do you get if you search very broadly? You get a billion and one results. But if you write a search for something really, 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 really specific, yeah, there might only be 50,000 or 100,000 results, but there's still 50,000, 100,000, still, still an audience there. And you do get what you get what you search for. So people are kind of thinking, oh, I don't want to go too niche. Niche is the new big. Niche is where we should all be writing. We should pick something really specific and write about that rather than playing it kind of broad. And then people think, yeah, but then you wouldn't get a you wouldn't get a mass market novel. You absolutely can. Because we know, I mean, you know, for having worked in publishing, how many, how many books do you have to sell to actually get into the, you know, top 100 in the charts, for example? I mean, at the very end of it, it's 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 a quite a small number, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, well, come on to 7 billion people on the planet. There's got to be a few thousand that are into the same kink that you are, well, you know. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and there's yeah. never been – I mean, publishers um, – we were having a conversation about this on the, the Facebook group recently, and, you know, I, I had a conversation with an agent recently, not my agent, another agent, who was telling me that uh, some science fiction fantasy publishers aren't looking for – straight down the middle of science fiction or fantasy anymore. They want stuff that crosses over. They want, you know, something that will appeal to a wider audience, which if you're writing straight science fiction and fantasy, you think, oh, no, that's the worst news ever. But we know from the indie world that straight SF, straight, you know, sells like the gangbusters. And, uh, and because that, you know, the audience is so vast, if you do have that weird little niche, 
you will find your tribe. It might take you a while to find them. Might take you a while, but they're out there somewhere, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, it can take a lot of persistence. But yeah, but I think they all I hang out together as well. That's the thing. Once they once do, you, yeah. once, once you, you find them, find one or two of them. <laughs> that well, those one or two become your, you know, your kind of biggest fans, and then they tell their you know Facebook groups or their. It's, their it's life interesting. Groups. It's interesting actually because I'm I'm about to put together a survey for people on my newsletter to find out who they are. Mm. And I might, I might put this out on social media as well. And I've just been talking to my publisher saying, hey, what are the questions I should be asking? Uh, so, yeah, I'm trying to, after two books and the third one on the way, I'm trying to figure out who's reading the books, what they like about the books, what they don't like, uh, you know, little things like that, just so that by the time the third book comes out, we'll have a much better profile of the kind of people who read these books. Um, and hopefully you know, find, find the weird little bend in the river where they live. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wouldn't it be great if, if like Amazon let you send surveys to your readers? Oh my gosh. Could you imagine? Uh, that would be I'm a sure. win-win. That'd be a win-win for everyone, wouldn't it? Cause Amazon, you'd be, well, you'd be more targeted as an author. You'd, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But the thing is, they know. They already know. That's I the know. thing. They already yeah, know. Yeah, but we they, need they to know a... as the writers. We need to, if we're putting our product on Amazon, the better products we're putting on Amazon, the more they're going to sell, the more money they're going to make anyway. So they should let us survey. Maybe we should start a campaign. Let us survey our readers <laughs> on Amazon. Wouldn't that be brilliant, though? Just to go, I mean, because they, you wouldn't be able, you still wouldn't get their email address. So Amazon would still completely fully protect everything. So like Jeff, if you're at, oh no, Jeff's gone, isn't he? Jeff's up in space right now. But if someone in Amazon is <laughs> listening, if someone in Amazon listens to this podcast, let authors survey their readers and everyone wins. Well, I mean, I've, uh, I've dealt with Amazon in the past. And they're, they're like, we've got all the data. Don't you worry your pretty little head about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just put your book up. We'll do the rest. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Give us some money. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. How much money do they need anyway? Anyway. Um, <laughs> E.T. Do you remember? Do you remember the first time you saw E.T. Mark? When, can you? Yes, I do. I had a, I had a terrible experience of E.T. because uh, one of my uncles brought around a pirated VHS and it was, <laughs> it was the worst. <laughs> Covered in snow. The sound was all like this. Uh, and I watched it for about 10 minutes. And I, I knew it was by Spielberg, who'd done one of my favorite films at that point, Razor of the Lost Ark and Jaws. You know, uh, I thought uh, and I, I, it was unwatchable. So I didn't see it until it was re released about the late 80s, maybe early oh, 90s. Wow. I remember going to uh, the cinema, the old flea pit in Sutton, where they'd re released it. And I saw it. And I was a. Uh, teenager you know but you know a lad you know and, and i'm sitting there desperately trying not to ball my eyes out <laughs> so, oh my god oh elliot oh god oh. Uh, and it's um i love it i think it's one of spielberg's best movies but i didn't see it when i was young uh and i didn't see it you know at, at that early age but uh but it is that's, a scary film yeah that beginning is that really is, scary it is scary yeah it's funny actually when you talked about that kind of like wobbly tape did that actually like normalize ET's voice? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he sounded like Michael Caine. It was really strange. <laughs> I want a photo. Give me a bloody telephone. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, you do. And the other thing, I mean, Bethany mentioned this as well, but we forget that when we watch those movies, we do experience them as those seven year olds, as those nine year olds, yeah, yeah. like when we see them. And the world's a lot scarier place, um, you know, when we're that age, we're kind of dealing with, you know, all the kind of the classic, like, you know, the, the darkness in the house going down the stairs at night, you know, thinking someone's always following you. There's monsters under the bed. And Spielberg knew exactly what he was doing. I mean, he, genius, absolute genius. But um, it is funny that, you know, and you referenced even Gremlins as well. And, 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 you, and you do forget, like, as an adult, how big these movies were in the world of a you know a young a young child or an early teen even the the the, the stroke of genius in et as well as the script was by melissa matheson who at the time was married to harrison ford and a lot of the dialogue mm. in that is based on his son's bickering over the dinner table, which is, Brilliant. you know, which is where lines like penis breath come from and stuff <laughs> like that, you know, so, and, and he, Spielberg encouraged the kids to improvise as well. And I think one of the great things about E.T. is, is, you know, for 
one of the first times you saw that kind of American suburban family. He did it to a certain extent in Close Encounters, but really focused on it in E.T., that American suburban family as they really were, sort of bickering over the table, yelling, there's chaos, there's pizzas being delivered, there's this and that, all of that going on, you know. So it felt really real in a way that those kind of movies hadn't before. And that kind of thing, Melissa, I think Melissa Matheson's a genius writer, and uh, that thing of observing reality and finding a place for it in your story um, and giving it that authenticity, she, she did that so, so incredibly well. And it's not to be underestimated, and it's uh, it's led to some brilliant, brilliant lines in, in that yeah, uh, it was- in that movie. It was. It's definitely a historical moment in in cinema fiction and storytelling, isn't it? Um, the question on everyone's lips, Mark, is: Did you have the ET toy where you press the button and the little end of the finger lit up red? <gasps> Seriously? No. no. Oh, like I, I said. Did. Like I said, I I I wasn't into it uh, until. Out. Yeah, and it's weird because I've. Um, I came to it later in life. I did actually, I've got the novelization. I got it on eBay just a few years ago because the novelization is really strange. Is that, you, no, is that bef- did that come out before the movie or after the movie? Just after the movie. Okay. Yeah. And and it's by, uh, I think it's by a guy called William Cotswinkle. And he gets inside E.T.'s head and E.T. kind of has the hots for Elliot's mother. It's really... <laughs> It's really oh weird. It's a, it's a strange, strange TMI. Book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's See the um, DVD extras on that one. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of that passed me by because also you know, around uh, about that age, I I was still mental about Star Wars. So you know that, that there's not much space that. for anything else, really. <laughs> <laughs> there really wasn't. No. no, no, that's funny. How absolutely brilliant! I love the story that Bethany told about you know, going to writing school and how brilliant that she met her husband there and then they end up making this movie and they got it into Tesco DVD top 10. I mean, that that's kind of like one of the bon- most bonkers story I think I've heard on, on the podcast in the last five years. Well, listeners and Mr. D, there's much more because um, uh, true to my word, we did get Bethany and her husband Peter in for a deep dive on making their film uh, Heretic and it's an hour of filmmaking joy well hell actually uh, but keep listening to the end of this podcast because we'll have a teaser clip uh where uh, from from our conversation but they talk uh, we go through the whole thing from soup to nuts from the first idea uh pre-production uh post-production the release uh it's all it's all good so it's um that's a deep dive uh, which is exclusive for patrons and academies so if you want to get the whole shebang uh subscribe you know come that's and sign absolutely. up What's the URL mark? It's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. Yes, I, I believe that right is. Anyway. Yes, I think so. Yes. There's a link yeah. in the show notes even to make it so easy for <laughs> you to, to join this amazing community and get the benefit of dozens, dozens of uh, deep dive episodes and all sorts of extra bonus goodies. Yeah. And this one's a real good one. Absolutely really brilliant. Really good laugh, but man. like it takes a certain kind of person, doesn't it, Mark, to make their own film. I mean, that. That deserves more than a Blue Peter badge, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, uh, it really does. It really does. And um, to do it their way as well, they were truly an independent film. They raised the money through sort of crowdfunding. They raised it themselves. Uh, You know, they they the two of them produced it together. Uh, it is an extraordinary story and not the way I would do it, frankly. <laughs> I think it's yeah. uh, Bethany mentioned that she cried a few times and I can totally understand why I think yeah. I'd have been a puddle on the floor. And a, so a um, husband and wife team as well. That that requires a special kind of relationship, doesn't it, really? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a testament to their relationship that they're, you know, they yeah, made it through the movie it's together. Ma- it's brilliant. It's not quite the same thing, but Claire and I went through something vaguely similar when we did the Edinburgh Festival in 2003, and we had two toddlers then. Well, a toddler. Oh, and a, and I haven't baby. heard this story. Yeah, yeah two so, toddlers in tow. Yeah. So did you have was, Did you have like a parent with you to kind of help? Look we after had Claire's. Her? Claire's parents came up with us, oh, thankfully. I was so, going to say, you know, yeah, yeah, that would have been some, absolutely disastrous otherwise. Yeah. So were you? So you you did Edinburgh Festival. You did your own performance, did you? The two, yeah, was well, it the it two was, of you? Uh, it, was a, it was a play called Me and My Monkey, um, <laughs> which came out of an argument I had with the celebrity chef Ken Hom 
uh, oh, which is random. a whole which is a whole other story. Because we're talking about ID cards and uh, Ken Hom, who is a lovely, lovely man. I just want to say that. Yeah, yeah, when yeah, I, I, when I worked at the publisher headline, we did a book on Thai cookery with Ken Hom. Fantastic mm. book, really, really good book. And he's a lovely man. But we're talking about ID cards. I think the government of the time was talking about bringing in compulsory That's ID right. cards. Yeah, I remember. And uh, he was saying, I think it's a good idea. I said, well, look, you know, whatever one man can create, another one can fake, you know, and it's open to abuse and blah, blah, blah. And it got me thinking about, because there's the the Beatles song, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey, because oh. everyone does have something to hide. And so I came up with this idea about a, a, a guy set in the near future where we all have a thing called the one card, which has everything on it. And in some ways, it's a weird precursor to our social media platforms in that, you know, we just give all our data to, you know, the government or whatever. And um, it's about a guy who fakes them and makes fake identities for people. And uh, it's uh, it's a fun little play. And, Sounds um, good. We did it in Epsom and it went down really, really well. And then uh, we took it to the Edinburgh Festival in 2003 because I was about to start at Orion and I knew that this was probably the last chance I'd have to, to do the Edinburgh Festival because it was mm. a play. Um, when I was at Ryan, I was going to be office-based and it was going to be completely different. So we thought, let's do it. Let's do it now. And it cost a ton of money, some of which oh. was donated by Martina Cole. Um, and oh, I, still- I remember. Now that this starts to like link uh, up because I, I remember you mentioning uh, that in the interview. I, though, yes. I, I, I still owe her some money. And, um, uh, and I think, I think uh, you're good for it. I think somehow how many millions has she sold? Yeah. Well, yeah. So that was her publicist said actually. She said, don't worry oh. about it. Um, and um, yeah, we did it. Uh, I'm glad we did it. We got some good reviews. Uh, and that was me done with theatre. Oh, <laughs> it was really? So that was the swan them, song. Yeah. Well, how? Okay, quick question: How do you do the Edinburgh Festival? Like, how is there an? Do you have to get on an official list and get, or do you just literally show up and book a book a theatre? No, and you have to. The the, yeah, it's it's all very organised. I mean, you've got you've got the main festival, and then you've got the Fringe Festival, and the Fringe Festival is what we were part of. Yeah. And there's a central body that organises the whole thing, oh, okay. and yeah. they so they say, okay, here are the venues. Yeah, yeah. Here are the yeah. venues, here are the prices, you know. It costs a ton. I mean, uh, this was nearly 20 years ago, 2003, mm. so I imagine it's um, – I kind of figure it's a, it's the same. But, I mean, back when we were doing it, there was something like 1,500 fringe acts doing the oh festival. Gosh. And I can imagine it's only got bigger. So it's um, it's tough. But that, that play I turned into a screenplay. I thought, oh, I'm going to make this into a film. And that screenplay got me an agent, and that got uh, got optioned, and that's how I met John Wright. No way! So yeah. when you actually look back and you drake it all the way back to its yeah, early yeah. stages, yeah. it was yeah. that play at the Edinburgh Festival that kind of probably kind of, started yeah. everything. Well, didn't yeah. start everything off, but was one of the key moments. In- I love doing that. I think every author should do this. <laughs> every author should remind themselves because you always think, oh, it'll never happen. But then when you look at all the crazy things that have happened in your life, the major coincidences, in quotes, all those different things that happen, when you actually like plot them back and you think, yeah, it's it's more likely to happen because look at all the crazy the way I my I went you know the way I met my partner the way I mm. did that the decision that silly thought I had which turned into a life changing decision moving country whatever I mean it's all these different things yeah, um, yeah. it's uh, it's fascinating isn't it life eh got to love it life eh <laughs> life <laughs> today's quote from Pocket life eh. Yeah, got to laugh, haven't you? You've got to laugh, brilliant <laughs> stuff. Excellent, <laughs> excellent stuff. Um, so we have a we have a clip to play, don't we, of a deep dive? Yes. So uh, jump in, folks. It's just a few minutes long, and uh, this is um, like I say. This this clip is where they discuss one of the problems they had with a key location for the film. You came up with the idea. Uh, Peter, you have the sole writing credit, but Bethany, I know you've got a story by credit. So how mm-hmm. long did it take to develop it into a, into a full-length script that was ready to shoot? Well, the interesting thing is that I think I think you wrote about 12 drafts, didn't you? I think there were about I think there were about by the time we got to a point where we thought we were ready to kind of go out and get financing and think about shooting, et cetera. I think you were on about your 12th draft, but this was in a time before kids and Pete was very dedicated. So we'd come home and he'd go straight upstairs and just start writing. So, mm. and every weekend he'd write. So 
I think the actual process of getting the script kind of to that point was only about seven or eight months, wasn't it? It wasn't a, it wasn't a huge protracted thing. But then the original, so the original movie and the original script was was set in a church, um, and we struggled terribly to find a church that would allow us to shoot because obviously it's a horror movie yeah. um, and most, if they're in use, you can't use them because they're, people are actually using them. And even though we were shooting at night, you know, people need to come in the day, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we found one that was, that had been deconsecrated and it was in the middle of Leeds and it was perfect. And we went to see them and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they wanted a load of money, but we were like, this is what we need. Let's go for it. Um, and then, and so this was in the beginning of December, um, oh God, 2010. Or 2010. Right. Yeah, 2010. 2009. In 2011, didn't we? Yeah, we shot in 2011. Oh, yes, we did. Sorry, yeah. yes, so yes, it was, my mistake. It, it was 20, in December 2010, we'd got a shooting date for February. Uh, we'd crewed up, we'd got everybody, we were all set to go. And I remember... They emailed us on like a random Monday or something like two or three weeks before Christmas and said, we've taken it to the committee. They don't want you to shoot. And we were like, oh. and they were literally our last mm. attempt. It was the last, the last people we could go to. Um, and we've got all the financing in place. We've got everything. And people were really excited. And I remember I, Pete and I sat down. I think probably in the pub again, I'm going to just say it. I think that's where we've had most of our meetings, uh, obviously, because Pete was like, had his, his face on the table and my <laughs> drinks lined up. Um, and we had like a really serious conversation. And 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 I think, it, you know, I'm going to say it was me that said, either we give up because we're never going to find somewhere to shoot this or you have to rewrite it. You have to change the location because it's not going to work here. Yeah. Um, and I remember you were kind of like, you know, there was kind of about probably only like, I, for me, it went on for, felt like it went on for ages, but I think it was probably only 24 hours. And then he, Pete was like, right, if that's what we've got to do, that's what we've got to do. And mm. you rewrote, he rewrote the script over Christmas and New Year and like didn't really see family and friends. I was pregnant with Sam. I was like, you know, like, what are we doing? <laughs> this is crazy. And I just remember, I can remember that Christmas and New Year because all it was was Pete in another room rewriting and then rewriting. So I think he did another draft over the course of a week and then another draft and then another draft. Um, and we couldn't, we couldn't get it back to shoot in February, which is why we pushed it back to August. Um, but by kind of the end of April, we had a new script, the new script, the new shooting script, which was then based in the house rather than mm -hmm. in the church. Because actually it wasn't as simple as kind of like just changing the location, yeah. like, mm -hmm. you know, everything had to change with it. Why were people there? What were people do? You know, it just didn't, none of yeah. it, none of it was the same. So it was like writing a new script. So, yeah, so Pete wrote two films, basically, <laughs> not just one. Yeah. And then the troubles just continued. <laughs> I think also it's weird looking back though, because I think in retrospect, the change in location actually probably helped us both dramatically, I think, and also in terms of like getting the production done. So, mm. I, I, so many problems that would have been introduced by having a, a church location. Mm. So it kind of it's kind of for the best in the end, because I think when you're dealing with a single location like a church. Like the, when I was writing it, the church that I had in my head, we probably would have needed to have found like Westminster Abbey, yes, <laughs> or you know what I mean, or a cathedral, because they just don't have those spaces to kind of like, oh, so and so's on the altar, but there's a monster <laughs> at the other end, but I can see the monster because the monsters, yeah, you can't. Whereas houses, you know, houses, you have those nooks and crannies, you have the kitchen, you have the bathroom, yeah. you have all these much more. It's a haunted. It made it more of a traditional film in many ways. It became more of a haunted house film at that point, but I think mm. ultimately it helped. If that doesn't get you excited, nothing will, folks. Dive in. <laughs> Bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. Join the crew. Join the BXP team. Come and uh, chat with me and Mark online and get access to all these incredible deep dives. It's where, where the really good stuff is, honestly. Absolutely brilliant stuff, Mark. Brilliant. So, Mr. Stay, social media this week. 
Yes, we've got some good news as as always. Um, so Rebecca Powell, who is on the BXP team, longtime supporter of us over on Patreon, she said a little while back, I found I've been long listed for the Caledonia Novel Award, and I've only gone and made the shortlist. They're Ooh. announcing the winner late soon with a blurb about each each of the shortlistees. So uh, if you pop over to the Caledonian Novel Award, so huge congratulations on on that, Rebecca. Just That's you know, getting on the long Rebecca. list is is achievement enough. Getting on the the uh, shortlist is absolutely amazing. And um, who knows? Who knows? Dun, dun, dun. Who knows when do they announce the results? Uh, you know. Uh, I think they might. Well, we'll we'll let everyone know we'll them, when yeah, they well, do, right. won't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't look that up actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, Kate Baker over on the BXP team, and also one of our academates as well. Uh, she's uh, she's having a short story published as well. Uh, it's uh, it's called The Projectionist, and you can check it over on Fairlight Books. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And uh, last but by no means least, Steve Gowland. Again, another long-term BXP member uh, who's been supporting us for a very long time. Uh, he has finished uh, his trilogy of uh, the the Soul's Abyss. Uh, so he's uh, he's got these um, incredible novels. So he writes as S.C. Gowland. He's got The Dark Crown, Coven of Shadows, and Darkness Falls. So that's The Soul's Abyss. That trilogy is all available now. So huge congrats to you, uh, Steve, on that. Well done, Steve. Brilliant stuff. And we hope that inspires you all as well. I mean, all these brilliant stories of, of every week, there's there's so much great stuff happening in the in the community and bestseller experiments. So if you have any incredible news, um, a big win for you, even if it might not feel like a big win, you know, um, let us know, drop us an email um, and come to the website. We've got a contact form and Mark and I do read every email that comes through and we always try and respond Indeed. as well. So. Absolutely. Yes, and find us on social media where Facebook is Bestseller Experiment, Twitter and Instagram is at Bestseller XP. Brilliant stuff. Now, if you would like to join the Bestseller Academy, if you'd like Mark and I to be your coaches in both the craft of writing and the writer's life coaching, which is what I do, um, do consider joining us. It's most unbelievable group of people, all with very, very similar like-minded. They're all like, I mean, we think everyone that listens to this podcast definitely has a very similar thing going on in terms of how they view the world. And um, and it's just a very supportive and inspiring place to be. And that's what we all need as writers. And that's really why it was set up. So come and join us at academy.bestsellerexperiment.com. Um, start, we've got about 30 courses now on absolutely everything that we've learned over the last five years on this podcast and more. Um, and yes, come and join us there. And if you would like to also support this podcast, as we've said many times already, but one more time, bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. So Mr. State, I hope you have a fantastic week. Good luck with your book launch with Queeve this evening. And I look forward to hearing more adventures in your world next week. <laughs> and so it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye. Bye.